All right, we have a second set of data here, and uh, we're going to be talking about math functions, uh, making your spreadsheet a living spreadsheet, and also we're going to create a, a column chart with error bars. Um, living spreadsheets, I'm going to talk about this <clears throat> all along. A living spreadsheet is where you have referenced other cells when you're doing mathematical functions, and the benefit of doing that is that if you find a mistake in your recorded data or you find a mistake in your calculations, it is very easy to change one thing and fix everything else. So instead of typing in, you know, uh, uh, the speed of light for some reason, you would type in, you know, 3 times 10 to the 8th. Instead of typing that into every place that you need to use that, you can type it into one cell and then reference that cell so that if you needed to change the speed of light because you're in a glass, for example, then the speed of light would be <clears throat> lower. You could just change that in one place and having, instead of having to change it in 20 places. Um, it helps, uh, especially if you have errors or you find errors, it helps you fix them much more easily and reliably. So here we have uh, data of, on different types of metals, and you're trying to determine the density of that metal. Uh, we know that the density is the mass of an object divided by its volume. And so here we've measured the mass um, of water, and then you've measured the mass of water plus a metal piece that you put into the water. And then you've also measured the volume of the water before and after you added that metal piece. And so we need to calculate the mass of each piece of metal, and we need to calculate the volume of each piece of metal, and then we need to calculate the density of each piece of metal. And then we're going to take an average <clears throat> and a standard deviation, and we have some true values here from literature. And so we're going to compare our answers to that literature value. We're going to make um, a column chart with error bars um, to illustrate that density and the standard deviation. So here, in order to find the mass of just the metal, I need to subtract um, the mass of the water from the mass of the water plus metal. So I can just use that negative sign, that's a dash up on your number line, uh, and so there's my mass of the metal. And again, I can just copy that over. Um, what I want to point out is that it's going to here, you can see it copied the formatting as well. So that's up to you if you want to use it that way. You can also use a copy paste um, to get that over there and paste it over. I'm going to do the same thing over here so I have masses all along. Now it is handy, as I've stated before, to make sure that you check your equations, uh, make sure that they're referring to the right things. We've got I7 minus I6, so that seems to be right. You just check a random sampling, they should all be uh, the same. Now here I need to do the volume of the metal, so again I'm going to subtract the volume of the water from the volume of the water plus the metal. Okay, again, simple subtraction, and I'm going to copy that over as well, just like that. And just copy it all over. All right. And then the density is going to be the mass of the piece of metal divided by the volume of the piece of metal. So I'm going to refer here the mass of the metal divided by the volume of that metal. And there's my density. I'm going to copy that all the way across. Okay. And as we talked about before, these sig figs, I mean, the number of decimal places here is sort of unreasonable. So I'm going to change the number of decimal places so that it is reasonable, hopefully in class. Not hopefully, for sure, in class you'll learn how to propagate that number of decimal places. Um, in this case, I'm going to keep the smallest number of significant figures. And so... Uh, you can do this for each data point, or right now I'm just going to keep three. All right, calculating the average density uh, uh, measured for each metal now. I'm going to, in this cell, do the math, but refer to the data that is above. So again, keeping this a living spreadsheet all along, use that average function, parentheses, average all the densities for copper together, uh, close parentheses, enter. Um, this uh, we can see if we can copy this over, but what do we get? Oh, nope. Okay, so you can see that my average 
cell, I copied it over to the very next cell, and so it moved these reference uh, cells over just one cell instead of three. Uh, since we're in that, I can see where I'm referencing cells here. I can get my hand and just move the reference over. Okay, and then I have to be careful because I'm going to have to do the same thing with the aluminum data and move that referencing over. Okay, so now I have some experimental data. I have some accepted or literature values. Um, and now I'm going to take a standard deviation of my densities and then I'm going to find a percent error or a percent difference between the accepted and the average density measured. So here I'm using the standard deviation. Okay, and again I'm going to select these three. And instead of copying that over, I'm, well, copying that over seems pretty simple right now. So I'm going to do that. Copy that over and then I need to make sure that I change my cell referencing by dragging this box over. So click and drag and that will change your cell referencing just like that okay so now hopefully we're referencing the correct things great to find a percent error the equation for percent error um, is going to be the absolute value so I can use these straight up and down lines to indicate absolute value of the uh, true value minus the experimental value straight up and down so making sure that that's a positive value, right? And then that whole thing divided by the true value. All right, so I'm gonna do that math here. I'm gonna calculate the percent error. Oh, we're gonna need a times 100%, okay, to make sure we're in percent. Okay, so here I've got my percent error. It's gonna be equal to the function for absolute value is ABS. Okay, and then I'm going to put in parentheses what I want. I want the true value minus the ex experimental value. Okay, and I need to divide that by the true value. So I'm going to go to the accepted value again and I'm going to multiply by 100%. Okay, <coughs> what I want you to notice here is that the multiplication and division signs are not necessarily in order, right? So um, this equation is not saying that the absolute value of this quantity is divided by these two things multiplied together, okay? It's saying that this is divided by this and then the whole thing is multiplied by 100. If you want to be really confident in your order of operations for your math, um, so say you did want these two things to be multiplied together before the absolute value was divided by them, you'd want to make sure that you put in parentheses here and that would change your answer, right? Okay, um, so be very careful with your order of operations. Um, in this case, you can even be more clear by putting parentheses around this quantity, right? Absolute value divided by B17, that quantity times 100% is gonna give you your answer, okay? But either way, uh, it should work out. And again, I'm gonna copy this over Okay, and I do want to make sure that I have, you know, a reasonable number of significant figures here. Okay, so those are pretty low errors. Um, in general chemistry, uh, you'll be looking for errors that are about 10% or less. Um, in higher level chemistries, uh, chemistry labs, uh, say analytical laboratory, you'd be looking for more like less than 1% error. Um, in physical chemistry labs, sometimes 50% error is acceptable. And so it depends on how, what is appropriate for what you're doing. This is where you're going to need to reflect on how well this number, this true value is known, how far away you are from the true value, and where you think that puts you as far as lab skill goes. Um, is that what is the error on this accepted density? Are we within error? Um, if you look at this standard deviation and you add plus or minus to your measured value, does the true value fall within that range? That would mean maybe you're too far away. You've got precise data, but not very accurate data. Okay. So those are the types of things we'll be looking for you to reflect on in your lab reports. All right. Um, I do want to show you how to use pi and uh, the caret for exponents. Um, this isn't a part of this data necessarily, but what if you had measured maybe your copper 
um, piece, your copper sample was a little ball. Okay, it's not a perfect ball, but it's a little ball. And so you measure the radius of that ball um, to be, or you measure the, the diameter, you would actually measure the diameter, to be like 1.4 um, centimeters. Okay, um, I'm not going to put the I'm not going to put the the units label on that number because as soon as you put letters in that cell, Excel can't do any math with that because it doesn't know that it's a number. So I'm going to put this over here. I'm going to put the units next to it in a different cell, and you'll notice that I've labeled what the diameter was of my um, trial one copper. Okay. Now, if I want to calculate the volume from that, just to compare to see which is more accurate, um, I'm going to need the radius. So I have the equation here. And you can see that when I typed it, I typed a P, but then I cl clicked up here in the font section to, s to set it to symbol instead of Calibri or whatever. Um, and that's going to show you, right, that this is a pi and not a P. Um, and then you can also see that I have a 3 here that I've gone to a superscript. So instead of putting a caret, so I'm typing out the equation to show you what it looks like, you would never write on paper that that is an R caret 3, right? You would write it as a superscript 3. So if you want to format it that way, um, you're going to highlight just the thing that you want to format it. So if I only wanted to format that 3, right, I'd highlight just that 3. Here I'm going to highlight just this 3. And on the very top toolbar, I'm going to go to Format, Cells, and that's where your options are going to be for superscript, subscript, strike through, etc. And you can change the font and, and these types of things that you can also do um, over here on the toolbar. Okay, so I chose the superscript to make sure that it's formatted correctly, um, just so that I know what the equation is to calculate the volume. Here I've got the diameter. I measured the diameter instead of the radius, so I need to make sure that I have my radius. So I'm going to label here radius. Okay, and you know that your radius is the diameter divided by 2. Okay, so I've got that, and that's in centimeters. Okay, I'm going to calculate my volume based on this equation. And again, you want to make sure that you have order of operations set. And I'm going to show you how to use pi and how to use caret. So here I'm going to calculate my volume. I've got 4 divided by 3, that's 4 thirds, right? That quantity times pi. Okay, you can type in the number 3.14 or 3.1415 or however many decimal, decimal places you want. You can type pi into another cell and reference that cell. Um, or you can have Excel tell you what pi is to some undetermined number of decimal places. And you would do that by just typing pi and then two parentheses. So it's just like a function. Pi is just like a function, but you're not taking a function of anything, right? There's no argument inside those parentheses. So just pi parentheses, this is kind of a weird one, and then times my radius raised to the power of 3, right? So now again, um, mathematical order of operations, if you want to make sure that these things are doing what you're telling them to do, you're making sure that they're all in parentheses. So I've got pi, just so this doesn't get, get confused with anything else. And then I've got this whole quantity here, okay, in parentheses, if you'd like. Um, that's not always necessary, but if there's a problem with your calculation, you're checking your answer and it doesn't make any sense, um, this is a, a first good step to make sure that you've got the right answer. So there, I've got my volume that's calculated. Again, reasonable sig figs. Okay, I've got two sig figs and one sig fig, so really I should just have one sig fig, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, here's my volume. You'll notice if you do a unit analysis by plugging the units into this equation, then uh, 4 thirds doesn't have any units, right? Pi doesn't have any units, but your radius has units and you've cubed them, right? So we have a centimeters cubed. And again, I just typed a three, but I want to format that as a superscript. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this window, type a superscript, and now it shows up there as a superscript. Um, one unit conversion that you'll learn in general chemistry is that one centimeter cubed is equal to one milliliter. Okay, and so I can compare this volume that I've calculated 
from my um, measurement of the diameter of that piece of metal. I can compare that now to the volume of metal that I've determined from the displacement of the water. And I can see that they're pretty close. I could do a percent error here as well, where we do absolute value of um, this minus uh, this value, and then divide it by, since I don't have, a, neither one of these are necessarily a true value, I could use the one that I think is more accurate. Um, I could also use the average of the two of them to really get a percent difference instead. Um, I'm just going to use this 1.54 because I know that that's a more accurate number and multiply that by 100. So that's 6.7 percent error between what I measured and the displacement from water. So that's pretty good. So this is a percent difference. Okay and again decimal places just keeping this reasonable. Okay so that's just a, a sample calculation of how to do that. Now um, we, as we've gone along, I've made this a living spreadsheet, right? I've always referred to other cells. I've done all the math in Excel. I've had Excel do that for me instead of just knowing that I measured 1.4, but the radius is half that, and so I just added a 0.7 there. Um, I've made it living because, as I said before, if you make a mistake and you discover that later, it's going to be much easier to fix it now. So say I realized that my volume of my water plus metal was not 51.563. I totally made an error there. I transcribed the number wrong. My lab partner wrote it down wrong. Um, I read my one as a, as a two. Okay, or I, I made a mistake with this value right here. Maybe this five here is not, is not a five, it's actually an eight. So what I can do is I can change my raw value here. And what I want to point out is that this number is going to change because that was a calculation involving, oh, not the volume of the metal. Yeah, that was a calculation involving that cell. The density is going to change because that was a calculation involving that cell. Okay, that means that this average density is going to change because that involved that cell. The standard deviation is going to change because that involved that cell. The percent error is going to change because it involved um, these cells. And this difference in this calculation over here is also going to change. Okay, so just um, Imagine if you had to redo all of those calculations by hand, especially if you had done it messed up six times, right? You'd have to redo everything. And while that's good practice, if you're not good at that at those math skills, um, this is really going to help you save time. Um, so if you put the time in in advance to make sure that your equations are set up uh, so that you're referencing other cells and you have a, a truly living spreadsheet, um, then you really don't have to fix anything except your first mistake. This will even cascade into plots. Okay, so I'm going to just watch watch this whole table here, watch these numbers, watch this number as I hit enter, okay? Okay, you can see, especially down here, my percent error jumped up from 6 to about 11% error, and now my difference here is 21.9% difference, okay? So that's a big difference, but it does all those calculations for you. I'm going to control Z so to uh, backtrack so that I keep that data. I'll build the the column chart and then you can see how it changes the column chart okay okay so column chart what I want to build is um, the density on the y-axis and the substance on the x-axis so I'm going to go to charts and I'm going to say I want a clustered column chart whoa that's a lot of things okay so let's uh, select data I'm going to go to select data, okay, and I'm going to just remove all this stuff right now. Remove, 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 remove. Okay, I'm going to add, uh, add a set, and the name is going to be density, okay. I've got my Y values. I want my Y values to be these uh, average measured densities here. And I want my x values to be the these three labels. Okay, so now I have the density, and I have um, my labels on the x-axis. I'm going to click OK. 
you'll notice that um, you don't really need uh, any labels here. You can, um, if I go to my chart layout, we can add then axis titles, title below, we're going to say this is the substance or the metal, okay? Um, and then we can add the vertical axis title, which would be the density, okay? Um, if you had multiple data sets, you could add copper uh, before it's been heated versus after it's been heated, and iron before it's been heated and after it's been heated. And in that case, you can label the blue ones as before heating and the red ones after heating. Okay, in this case, maybe this uh, legend isn't so useful. Uh, in uh, Also, here we should make sure that we label that this is milliliters, grams per milliliter, right? This is the units. And we want to be uh, thorough there. Now, just like on our calibration curve plot where we added error bars, hopefully it'll be easier to see them here, we can add error bars here as well. So I'm going to control click um, or left click, right click, sorry, right click on my data. I get this format data series just the exact same way that I had done this in the other plot and I can add error bars. Again, these are gonna be Y error bars, right? Because it's a plus or minus in the density. So I'm a, I want a, a plus and a minus, I wanna see both. And you wanna use the custom option and you're gonna specify the plus and you're gonna specify the minus using the standard deviation, right? That's what the standard deviation means. You've got the average value plus or minus the standard deviation. So here's that. Okay, and then it looks like it didn't put a cap on there, so I want to make sure I've got a cap on there so I can see the difference. Okay, and now you can see your error bars. Now, here you've got a smaller error error bars. You can barely see them, but here they're, they're fairly clear. So we've added our column chart with error bars, um, and that would be the end of this tutorial.